Hey, what's going on, everyone? Check out what's coming up this week on Legacies. I'm like, who's this picture of this kid? I don't know. God, like, <laughs> yeah, God. Oh, wait, that was a baby picture. Well, I mean, it is a chameleon pack, so I'm not surprised you can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. That's it, Wes. I'm coming out of retirement, baby. I'm moving to New Brunswick. Yeah. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to Legacies. I'm your host, Tom Ritchie. Joining me, Mr. Wesley, the Wizard Bowls, co-host, executive producer, COO. You do a lot of things, man. I'm never going to let it down. I do. And my, uh, my wizard hat's officially in the mail, so uh, okay. hopefully I, it arrives soon. I want to see it. I want to see it. Uh, we've got a great show today. I'm really looking forward to uh, being joined by Genevieve Newton of Stewart Farms. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but I'm super interested in these bath bombs. I can't lie. I need to understand this world of bath bombs and THC. Yeah, I, uh, I was under the impression that the bath bombs were just CBD. And then you, you mentioned to me last week that no, they're, they're actually yeah. THC, and which is and crazy. And because they're not edibles, they're like... 100 to 250 maybe 300 grams or um, milligrams of thc which is crazy. i don't know how that works so i need to understand yeah, that so i know I other assume, science so you're absorbing it through your skin I yeah guess? you is must that... be like a, like a transdermal cream of some sort um i would assume that you absorb it through um very popular from what we've seen across socials over you know the last six months or so um but anyways we'll uh, we'll figure all that out and we'll be uh, we'll be speaking with her in no time um big weekend Big weekend. We we were at Can Expo on uh, Saturday. It ran from Friday to Sunday, but uh, we made it out there on on Saturday. And what did you think? I had a great time. Yeah, it was good. Um, I, I feel bad for the poor buggers that had to get there on Thursday to set up. Um, that wouldn't have been fun because you know in my area I didn't get as much snow as they did. They they certainly got a lot more. Um, but yeah, no great show Saturday. We got to meet with a lot of our our brand partners, especially, but meet a lot of new and exciting folks and. Um, depending on who you spoke with, it was either, there's a lot of potential in the industry. There's a lot of positivity, but then others that you would speak to, it was doom and gloom. And it was, you, you felt bad, um, that some of the brands are, are struggling the way they are also felt really bad for those individuals that only had one slash 1.5 people manning their booths. And, uh, they, they were just backed up. I mean, there was so many people at the booth. We could barely get time, uh, with them at times. So. Yeah, there were, it seemed really good for, it was tough to get access to some people's booths when we were there, which was a positive sign, right? And, and you know, we wanted to go talk with some of our brand partners, you know, we wanted to talk to, you know, Irie was there and, and uh, uh, VCC and, and TL, TLM and Pinners and sometimes it was legitimately hard to, you know, jump in there and, and, and talk to them, right? Because the booths were so cramped full of people wanted to talk to them. So that was obviously positive, but uh yeah, definitely a big, big amount of setup going into that event for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, one of the things that I found interesting was the samples. So they're sampling. Um, some of them technically were non-compliant <laughs> when it comes to the sampling itself. Um, just the tubes, that sort of things. Other some brands right on point. Other ones, I'm like, ah, you're getting away with this. But regardless, great show, great event. Uh, Can Expo blew it out, and uh, I, I also feel for Discipline Stoner, so Eleven and, and Winnie, um, a full weekend, high energy the whole time. They did a fantastic job. Um, high energy, yep. But man, they must have been just worn out come Monday, like sleep for a week situation, right? Yeah, I, I can imagine they're probably, uh, they probably lost some of their voice too, because they were, again, three <laughs> yeah. days of, yeah. of, uh, of uh, rapping on stage as well, yeah, and yeah. they were singing and stuff, and yeah, they're probably completely tanked uh, yeah. after that weekend. So, for sure. Um, we're not complaining about the samples and stuff though, because we absolutely walked away not with, uh, a good chunk of stuff, some new stuff we haven't tried before, and some enlightening stuff. And yeah, um, and and Kip, had... Mr. Kip Road delivered, um, brought a special a special sample that he had purchased himself, I think, from BC. Um, you know, he talked up the after eighth, but you know, this is your your big entrance back or return to flower and pre rolls. I mean, you've been in the beverage space for a while and the edibles, but flower, you kind of moved away from and and it seems victoria cannabis companies brought you back in yeah i mean i don't want this to be a shameless plug because they are a they're not partner, paying for this i'm, I'm they're not, not paying yeah, for I'm, this I'm perfectly okay talking about this like so yeah I, I have not been traditionally a flower person i you know high school days and stuff like that my buddies were into flower and 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 that's you know my introduction to everything but once everything 
became legal and, and edibles was really my, my go-to. And obviously more recently, the beverages that those have started to come on the market. And I enjoy those because I, you know, um, I know the dosage I'm getting and I know I time everything. Right. So I know, mm -hmm. that, you know, in roughly 40 minutes after taking this edible or this beverage, right. I know exactly where I'm going to be. Right. And flour for me had always been a mixed bag of, of it can be, you know, extreme for me uh, in five minutes in, or it can take 20 minutes or it, it was always a mixed bag for me. And, and, some of the, the, the flour I'd smoked had been fairly harsh and stuff like that. Just wasn't always positive experience. So mm -hmm. edibles and stuff had always been different. Now, <laughs> when I came back from Can Expo and I got the, uh, one of the samples was this G-Wagon. Um, and it was a pre-roll G-Wagon, um, 0.5. Fucking <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> and, and I feel, I feel now that I'm, that I'm glad that that was my reintroduction into flour because it was superb. And again, I'm no expert when it comes to flour i'm no connoisseur or anything like that i for me though really 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 enjoyed smoking that but now kind of like i feel ruined because <laughs> i'm always going to be you're going to compare something. everything yeah. to vcc everything now. yeah um, um, which is not a bad thing because there are a lot of great producers out there um, 100%. finding the ones you know in some cases some will hit harder some are harsher on the throat but I love that they spend a lot of time and energy coaxing out the Terps, right? Uh, we got to meet Ryan Lee, um, you know, geneticist. This guy is, I've never felt so uneducated. Geneticist and neuroscientist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Neuroscientist. I've never felt so uneducated in the cannabis space after speaking with that gentleman. Um, he, he was incredible. We're going to have him on the show in a future episode. Um, he's done a lot and, you know, he's done some breeding specifically for Victoria Cannabis Company. Um, and others, right? Chimera. I mean, he's been in the space a long time. Um, but yeah, great guy. Great. Just a great group of individuals across the entire show. Um, and one that I was disappointed that we didn't get time with was Great White North Growers. Um, I had mentioned to you yesterday, I took a call with George, uh, one of the co-founders over there, and it was so enlightening to speak with him. Um, he wasn't sugarcoating the industry or anything about the industry. Um, but he was just a genuine dude and you could see and tell that great white North, they're doing it right over there. Um, it left me super energized. You know, I, I think I, I had messaged you and the rest of the team saying, wow, that was, that was a good meeting, a really good meeting. Um, obviously I was, you know, we, we were talking about other things outside of high flyer and that sort of stuff, but he was super keen and interested in the work that we were doing. Um, just a great guy. And I am for one, looking very forward to having him on a future episode. And if we can, we need to figure this out. We'll do a tour. We'll get to Quebec. We'll get to Montreal. Maybe we hit Ono. We can hit lot 420. We can get over to Great White and do a tour of the facility because, um, that just, it seems like just such a great team also. And I didn't know this, um, Pat page or Patrick page is their head of cultivation there. He was previously with MTL Cannabis. He's responsible, from what I understand, um, and if I'm recalling correctly, is their sage and sour. They have a sage and sour cultivar that became very big, became uh, big in the hash scene as well. Um, but anyways, he's he's over at Great White North Growers, um, which is incredible. Yeah. Wasn't, uh, did, weren't you mentioned that George was also a Montreal Canadian at one point? I, I afterwards, cause he, it was funny cause we had, yeah, I think we had an hour, right. But we, we ran way over cause it, we were just having so much fun on this call. And he mentioned something about his, his lifetime of hockey. Um, and you know, we, we didn't spend a lot of time on it. And afterwards I was just looking at some of, you know, cause I knew that he was from, he had spent time in media with CFCF, um, in, in Quebec. And, and I mean, that's, that's his history. That's what he's done forever. And then his foray into cannabis. But so I just Googled something about him and it popped up and he was, he was drafted in like this in 78. Um, I don't know the story. I don't want to misspeak on this. I mean, we can unpack that with him if we can get him on the show. Um, but yeah, is from what I understood is he played for the Habs. Um, not sure high ranking, low ranking. I have no idea. Um, but still pretty cool. Seems like we uh, probably should keep that episode away from Ian because he'd be quite disappointed if we had a Montreal Canadian on here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're Red Wings we're certainly not getting any Red Wings uh, players on, that's for sure. Well, who knows? I mean, so, we might. so if we have George on as a Montreal Canadian, you know, we've had Ross Rebegliati as a um, professional Olympic snowboarder. I feel like we're, you know, on track now. We definitely need a pro UFC fighter and we're going oh, yeah. to yeah. need a F1 driver hey, on here at some point. Let's call on Georges St. Pierre. 
GSP. Yeah. GSP. Yeah. That'd be fine. Yeah. That'd be fine. Hey, everyone. If you're like me, you get overwhelmed by the product selection in this crazy cannabis market. Every two weeks, we drop a digital flyer with a curated list or featured products that you'll want to try. Subscribe to our digital flyer at thehighflyer.ca. And you can also check out our historical flyers to see the products that we featured with a selection that I approve of and Wes certainly does. Check it out at thehighflyer.ca. So, you know, you touched a little bit, Wes, on, um, you know, your experience with with edibles and, and drinks. We're going to have Matt from Sheesh on at some point to fully understand the world of beverages. It's one that I don't understand. Um, but this ties in. There's a lot, of, a lot of chatter going on around the recommendations for the amendments um, that have been put forth. Um, what's what are the what are the highlights, lowlights in there that you specifically want to maybe discuss or address? I think like specifically to the, the not increasing the edibles, you know, milligram limit, the 10 milligram limit. I think that the main piece thing I took away from that document on why that they, they recommended not increasing that was it was still all came back to apparently, you know, the children, right? Saving the children. And, and of course, that's absolutely important. We don't want to expose children at a young age to, you know, uh, to cannabis and things like that. But, yeah. you know, to me, it, it doesn't make, I, I keep comparing stuff to alcohol and I hate doing that, but you know, I can walk into a, an LCBO and buy something that's, you know, 40% alcohol, 60 proof, 70 proof, 80 proof. And you know, it just doesn't make sense to me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding the, the, why that wasn't recommended. It doesn't make, doesn't make sense. Yeah. To me. I, I think I love, so Shane Morris and I go way back when Shane was with Aurora, um, you know, Aurora was a, a client of Ample's and he always puts forth some great information and, and I loved his takeaways, which were, you know, quick hits on, um, recommendations and non-recommendations basically, and where the wins and the losses were in that, um, there are a lot of arms up in air over the 10 milligram, right. On the edible front. And I would, I would be one that agrees that I would like to see it increase, but I also, somewhat understand why health Canada is hesitant to open that up. So in the illicit market, obviously you can, you can purchase edibles. Um, I do not agree with that. And I'm going to take a stance on this probably in a second, but, um, you can buy those edibles at 250 to a thousand, 1500 milligram chocolate bars, um, which makes it difficult to compete in the regulated market with those, those products and those individuals that are purchasing them. But the difference is this, and, and I don't want to screw this up. If we end up using this as a clip, I may get slaughtered by those that know better. But when you are consuming cannabis by flower or pre-roll, you are decarboxylizing it through heat when you smoke it, okay? So you're activating that acid molecule um, that, that may be attached in there. So you're, you're basically taking T THCA, you're combusting it, and it's becoming THC into the body. Um, and it goes almost an immediate effect to the brain. Now, the difference is when you consume it, you're consuming because in order to make an edible or a beverage, you have to decarboxylize the cannabis ahead of time. So you're, you're heating it up, right? Um, and you're, you're taking that THCA molecule, fucking science, so like, oh my God. Anyways, you're taking that THCA molecule and you're changing it to a Delta 9 THC molecule. Now, when you consume that, by the time it makes its way through the digestive system into the liver, it's called first pass metabolism, if I recall this correctly. And when your liver takes that THC molecule, the Delta 9 THC molecule, it converts it to a, um, it's an 11 hydroxy THC molecule. Now the difference is, is that an, uh, an 11 hydroxy THC molecule passes the brain blood barrier much faster, much faster. And in comparison to the Delta 9 THC molecule, it is more potent. Now, there aren't necessarily studies that quantify how much more po um, power, um, potent it is, but it's a general understanding and rule that yes, an 11 hydroxy THC is more potent than THC. So, when you think about that, one, it's more potent. So, if you take a 10 milligram drink, by the time it's converted um, and it, plus, it passes that blood brain barrier, chances are it's responding like it's 15 milligrams um, or more. It, the math could be off for me, right? But it's more potent. And if you smoke, let's say, a half gram joint that is 30% THC, you've technically just consumed 15 milligrams of THC or that Delta 9 THC. 
So I understand the hesitancy because there's not enough studies or research at this point in time that would justify through research, this is what's happening to the body. And the other problem is, is that when you're consuming an edible, some people have faster metabolisms, some don't. So it could be 20 minutes, it could be an hour. And other individuals, I've done this, I've greened out bad on edibles where I'm not feeling anything. And you start taking more and more. All of a sudden, you've got a really bad trip, a horrible experience, you're greening out, you're, you're potentially looking for CBD oil if you believe in that science that it'll help bring your high down. Um, so I, I get it. I understand Health Canada's hesitancy, hesitancy on raising that THC limit um, for edibles. Um, it would be great to understand this world a little bit more. And obviously, Matt from Sheesh would help us to, to uh, you know, unpack that and really understand, you know, not only that, but help us to understand from their point of view why they want it increased or do not want it increased. For me, I always like, <laughs> I'm very frugal in some means, and I will look at it as I'm getting, so if you take a, a, a typical beverage, I don't know, what are they, $5 or so, right? Yeah, between 5 and five and $8, depending on the, yeah. Right. So you're getting 10 milligrams for 5 to $8, which is not uncommon across a lot of the edibles categories, right? Whereas I could buy a concentrate or flour and I'm paying, you know, $15 for 30, 40, 50 milligrams. So I always look at it as dollar value by milligram. That's the, that's currently the issue I have with it. Um, but when you look at the science behind it and how those molecules are actually responding to the body, um, or within the body, it, it does make sense. So my little bit of Bill Nye, the science guy there, I don't know if I'm hundred percent accurate, 50% accurate, but you know, someone will, I'm, I'm sure someone will correct me. <laughs> Well, that's it. I'm going to buy you a lab coat now. And you're, anytime you do those sessions, you're going to wear the lab coat on here. That's Speakers it. and all that shit. I, I think the other, the other, the, this one was extremely outrageous to me, the recommendations. And I have no idea where this came from. But A, there was no recommendations to change the packaging, right? What's allowed oh, yeah. on packaging. Yeah. Which, okay. I, you know, uh, we, we, again, the children, we don't want the children to be exposed to super colorful, bright things. And, and sure. you, know, you know, however, one of the recommendations there was to allow flower packaging uh, in some form to contain a slightly transparent section, I guess, so you can see what product is inside. To me, which is absolutely fucking asinine because all that product is stored in the back of the dispensary anyway, and you can't see it until you're ready to purchase. Yeah. So I don't, I don't get... In most cases, yeah. In yeah, most cases, in most you're cases. right. Yeah. And now you're also reducing the amount of available space on yeah, the packaging that's, that's to be a able good to point. put important information. Yeah, right? that's a really good point. Yeah. So that, that was just another ridiculous one to me. But yeah, um, and I mean, even even for those dispensaries that do have, um, you know, even packaging and display cases that you can look at, I, I still struggle. I mean, you know, I'm getting older. My eyes aren't the greatest. I think even someone with perfect eyesight struggles to see some of the labeling and, and you know, what's on it. What's the THC content? Where, who is it produced by? Right. Outside of the brand. Um, so, you know, putting a clear window on it. Um number one, that's going to get expensive in the packaging realm. So as we know, like bag, these Mylar bags aren't cheap and, you know, they're paying anywhere from 15 to 30, 70 cents a piece for these. So now you're going to add the complexity of having a see-through or clear window on it as well. I don't like it. Um, what I would have liked to see is a lot more recommendation in the reform of the, the marketing regulations. Um, like come the fuck on. <laughs> Like this is just, we're waiting and we're waiting and these brands are struggling and it's not, we can't just bucket it all. It's, it's, it's marketing, it's excise tax, it's this, it's that. It doesn't work like that. Um, and on that note, we actually have secured, um, um, Jonathan Wilson from Crystal Cure, very vocal about the subject when it comes to the regulations and the amendments and the recommendations, um, great individuals. So we've confirmed him for our 420 episode uh which we record early but anyways exciting exciting what do we have here yeah it is so uh again we talked about the regulations the marketing regulations not getting any sort of um recommendations to, for massive change right and this article from again uh Stratcan, thank you again for amazing articles and timely articles because they continue to you know come up super quick and they're always so detailed and but th there was a great article from Stratcan uh, on the 26th that mentioned you know the the costs of alcohol and cannabis um on society especially in, in Canada right 
And there was, I'm not going to go through this entire article because it's, it, it basically breaks down each province because, you know, of how alcohol and cannabis are treated differently in each yeah. province. So if you get a chance, read this full article, but it's getting very hard. What the article kind of comes to a summary of is it's getting very hard for the government to rationalize, you know, the preferential treatment of alcohol over cannabis when it comes to marketing and all these other things. When you look at things like this, like the statistic here where alcohol ended up, you know, it's over 16 times more costly to society uh, than cannabis it's fucking is crazy, so far. Man. The, the part that pisses me off the most is the amount that is spent on healthcare. And, and I get it that, you know, world of economics, we're not quite even yet. But even if you were to multiply by the same factors, you would see that there will always be more money spent in the world of healthcare because of alcohol or due to alcohol than you would in the cannabis sector. Um, that part really ticks me off. Um, and they've done a great job at breaking this down. And obviously Ontario has its challenges because it's, you know, the, the largest amount of sales and you can really see the offset of what it's costing taxpayers at the end of the day. Right. And I mean, as much as we talk about the illicit market too, affecting the, you know, the cannabis market and things. I mean, if you look at that, that one stat right there from, from there where it says, uh, where is it here? Um, the cost of the criminal justice system in Canada, is, you know, so at nearly $4 billion or 40% of the ju criminal justice costs are related to alcohol versus a quarter of that, um, uh, being cannabis. So sure. We have some issues in the cannabis market with the, the illicit market, but you know, uh, alcohol is still contributing way, way, way more to the criminal Agreed. justice side. And, and it's not changing anytime soon. That's the thing. Like we've, we've, we've seen this for a while. It's, it's not going anywhere. Um, if anything, from what I'm reading is they're going to double down on budgets to be able to educate the public on cannabis use. And dude, they've spent so much fucking money already. Um, I'm not saying, you know, to continue to develop and, you know, amend programs, but it, it, you know, you keep touching on the illicit market. You've said it a couple times and I've got to take a stand on this for a change, right? I, I usually yep. remain very neutral when it comes to certain things, but here's the thing. And, and people will criticize me and I don't really care what the fallout will be from this, but if you support the illicit market in Canada, you are the fucking problem. Okay. If you are an influencer or you have a massive Instagram account and you are receiving illicit product to pump and promote across socials, you are the fucking problem. It, people will, oh, Tom, you were in the illicit market. You were in the black market. Yes. Prior to the Cannabis Act coming into effect, right? At that point in time, I said, I won't be able to compete. Number one, I won't make any money. Number two, if I get caught in this market, yeah, that's really going to fuck me up now, right? Before the Cannabis Act, it was if you got caught in illegal activity, chances are it was a slap on the wrist in, in, with cannabis, right? So if you are consuming, it, it's different, right? You're growing at home for plants. You want to share some weed with your buddy. That's different. You want to press it. You have rosin. You have make your own edibles. You want to share it with a friend. That's different. If you are, because we're seeing these reports now, if you are packaging them to nerds or uh, stoned gushers or anything like this that rep was, uh, uh, re um, what is it represents child packaging or any of it. I don't care. It's wrong. And you are not serving this industry. You have all these individuals that have moved from legacy to legal that are working their asses off. They've spent a fortune to be here. Don't tell me you can't do it. If you don't want to do it, that's one thing, but you know, the part that really bothers me are the influencers that are, are, they're accepting these products. They are clearly illicit and they're pumping it. Here's the thing. We know within the community that understand the regulations that's illicit, but what's happening is for those that are on the fringe or barely understand the, the market or the industry, they can't, they can't understand the difference, right? They just see cannabis packaged this, they even put THC levels or, or limits and, and labels on right, them. Right. They're even saying that they've got them. You know, they've got COAs and oh, they've gotten yeah. tested and, and stuff. And, like, and, and maybe they did, but you can, in the regulated market, you know they had to, or they're losing their license, and it's millions to get set up. So um, please stop supporting the illicit market. You want to you wanna grab some weed from a buddy, something like that, it was a grow at home, that's different. But if you are, um, you know, we'll end up getting death threats over this or something probably, but I don't give a shit. It's just, hey, you know what? we're so I, close. I look at it as, I look at it as, 
the uh, three uh, we, we've had four big guests on so far right and you know especially when we've had guests like kevin you know jeff and sherry at smoker farms yeah and kip you know if you've heard all their stories from us so far and how much they how much they're doing for the industry how much they struggle and you're still pushing or, or at least helping promote that illicit market then you absolutely then then quite frankly fuck off <laughs> yeah it's there's been too much money blood sweat tears put into this for them to become legitimate um and you're you're stealing money i'm sorry um operate somewhere else go to a country that does not have legalized framework that's just the way i look at it now anyways enough of that um i wanted to ask you real quick just back to can expo for a second um who who had your favorite booth at can expo i'll tell oh, you what man. mine was i'll tell you what mine was um I think Friday, I can get you next fucker. Friday had a bitchin booth. <laughs> yeah. Bitchin booth at, at yeah. uh, Can Expo. Yeah. So they had a bunch of old I'll pop a, I don't have it on me right now, but I'll pop it up on the screen uh for the video later. But old ass CRT retro yeah. TVs all stacked on top Tubes, of each other. Yeah, yeah. Straight, straight street vibe uh in that I booth. Loved it was it fucking too. awesome. I liked I liked a lot of booths. Um I think something, you know, obviously we the high flyer have this retro feel. It's something that we've been wanting to, you know, right from inception. It was we want this vintage 70s rec room shag carpet vibe. Um for me next Friday, they I I can just relate. Um and you know, they're they're cool. Um we actually we're confirming. I'm going to try. Actually, I should try and call Gavin or Sam. They are to be on next week. So we, we've got next Friday. And this isn't a plug for them saying, oh, they had the coolest booth. Those tube tower setups were pretty fucking cool. Um, now, Sam and Gavin were, were meant to be there. Both took sick. Um, and they've got all this stuff going on. They're, you know, they're flying to Europe. I think it's the week after. They're going to be at ICBC. Um, Gavin's a, a DJ and music event coordinator um on top of everything they do at next friday but anyways um next friday booth was was really cool i think next between next friday irie vcc and tlm they definitely always had the traffic it was tough to get there to them they did the other one too that had uh her um, great amount of traffic was drips Drips oh, had drips, that. yeah, yeah. So drips, yeah. I, I loved what drips did. So they uh, they had a great booth as it was, uh, a bunch of nice swag and stuff like that. It really stood out because it was right there as you walked in the door. But they also had that awesome um, the inflatable blow up chair. <laughs> yeah, it was like a struggle it was like a fifty. It. <laughs> it was like a fifteen twenty foot tall inflatable drips chair, and it served its purpose because it was cool as shit. You had people jumping on it to take pictures with it, and then yeah. you got the Drips logo plastered all over it's it. It's perfect, and that's just getting shared all over social. Yeah, I saw people from other like working at oh, yeah. other brands yeah. jumping on the Drips chair. <laughs> you know, so it served it served its purpose. It was yeah. awesome. It was very cool. I, I like watching people struggle to get in it. I think uh, at some point in time they'd taken a chair over because it was tall, and it would have. I didn't attempt to get in it. I probably would have knocked the thing over or something. But um, yeah, very cool. Um, let me uh, let me do this because. I want a hundred percent. Just Sam and Gavin over at Next Friday. They're super elusive. Um, let me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I'm gonna give this a twenty five percent chance that he answers. That he answers. Book. He's. He's. <laughs> I think he's in the middle of setting up. Um, yeah, of course. he's always busy. Always. But there's. He's setting up. There's a big music festival. Let me see. I'm gonna put him on speaker. So let's see if we can get him on. Can you hear that? It's coming yeah, through. Bring it a little bit closer. A little to bit Mike. closer. Yeah. Tom, what's going on? <laughs> what are you saying, Gavin? I'm just, uh, I'm just in the woods right now, man. Yeah, <laughs> we're. How you doing? I'm doing good, man. We're we're recording right now. We just uh, we just announced that next Friday is going to be on next week. I'm calling to confirm 100 percent because we know you guys have so much shit going on. <laughs> you decided to record it, so I'm recording, recording it. it. You can't back out of it now, buddy. <laughs> yeah, we're on April third, man. Looking L forward to it. Love it, love it. And you're setting up for a big, big music festival right now, right? Yeah, I'm in my ninth year of the downtown deep frost here at Everton. We've got wow, a big, big weekend coming up. So that's why it gets right. That Sam's Night Club. It's going to be a big weekend, man. There, 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 there won't be any next Friday weed circulating that crowd, will there? Of course. <laughs> If we're in the room. There's always next Friday, seriously. Oh, I love it. Love it. Thanks for picking up, brother. We'll see you next uh, next Wednesday for recording. Anytime. Take care, Tom. All right.
All right, that's a that's a there. legal that's a legally binding contract. Wes, I want this clip broken <laughs> out. Okay, Sam and Gavin, or just Gavin, or just Sam. Um, I, I love their brand. I love their backstory. Um, very reminiscent of my old days. You know, uh, dropping peas at the corner. Love their swag, which hopefully at some point in time we'll be able to do something with them to get uh, get people access because everyone wants it. Right. Um, and they're always sold out. One thing with uh, next Friday, we finally got to meet Alex. So Sesh with Alex is, I think, um, her yep. Instagram handle. She was holding court. I mean, I, I didn't get a chance to speak with her partner at the booth there. Um, so I apologize. I'm not sure what her name was, but um, she knows her shit and she does a very good job representing that brand. She knows. I think you walked away with some dank Sinatra. Is that right? Yeah, I did. I actually I actually smoked that dank Sinatra last night. Um, and uh yeah, that was that was really really nice. Yeah, really the, really nice the, as well. The terp uh, flavors coming out of there. I think I've got one that I'm gonna try maybe this weekend. It was cream you and tina. A, you have a you have a cream and tina. Cream yeah, and tina. That's yeah. Right. Um, that's cool. What I was really hopeful for. So as I had mentioned, you know, we were hoping that Sam and Gavin would be there. They took ill, um, which is fine. Alex, she held court anyways. Um, but outside of that, um, I want, I want the chameleon connoisseurs pack so bad. If people haven't seen this yet, this is, I think seven of their most popular or seven of their current cultivars or strains in one pack, um, half gram formats. I think, sorry if I'm misspeaking, we'll have them talk about it. I don't know what it is about it other than the fact that one love next Friday, every product I've ever tried is, is great. Um, but I just love sample packs. I brands. Do more sample packs, please. Well, I mean, it is a chameleon pack, so I'm not surprised you can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> there we go. Uh, what else do we got on the go before we bring Genevieve in? Uh, I don't think we've got uh, much else at the moment. So I think we can probably take a quick break and uh, we can come back with uh, Genevieve. Or maybe I'll just do a quick plug on uh, on the High Flyer. Get your get your licensed brand swag from the highflyer.ca and uh before that but yeah we'll we'll take a break and we'll come back with genevieve awesome looking forward to it we'll figure out the world of bath bombs i need one i'm gonna i'm gonna go out after this episode today and i'm gonna find some okay yeah i have i don't think i don't think i've had a bath since i was like five and only showers <laughs> but, but okay I was, gonna, yeah. I was gonna say showers though at least <laughs> yeah exactly uh, we'll be we'll be right back after this break Hey, what's up, everyone? Have you ever considered medical cannabis? You probably should. Chances are you have insurance benefits that will cover that. We at High Flyer Media have partnered with leading medical cannabis provider, Mendo Medical, to bring you an exclusive offer. If you sign up or register using code FLYWITHUS, you'll get 15% off your first order. But the advantage is far beyond that. The selection is one of the best we've ever seen, curated by Jay Schwartz himself. He ensures that every product going out the door meets his high quality standards. Again, sign up or register with Mendo Medical using code FLYWITHUS. All right, welcome back. We're joined by Genevieve Newton of Stewart Farms, Director of Cultivation. Genevieve, thanks for joining Legacies. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, of course, of course. We uh, we have to pay tribute to 2023 tro- a Top Grower, right? There's there's a bunch Thank of awards you. in there, though, that they, they have similar names in some cases, but you've won a lot more than just that. And the Stewart yeah. Farms team has won a lot more than the, just that, correct? Yeah. Walk us through some of those accolades first before we get into the history, because I want to make sure everyone understands the legend we have on here with us today. <laughs> All right. Um, I won my first award in 2019. It was for highest uh thc and it was for hemp fest 2019 in calgary and um i also entered an indica strain that got selected as best indica that year and then in 2020 i won um second in top female brower for hemp fest in 2020 Mm -hmm. and then in 2021 i won top female grower um first and then highest thc strain and highest cbd strain um i entered two different cultivars in two in those two categories and um won those and then (laughs) recently last year we had a really good year stewart farms won um top standard producer at the grow up um ceremony and then also top topical with our blue dream bath bomb Mm -hmm. and then separately at the end of the year last year i got chosen as uh 
Canada's 2023 top grower for Grow Opportunity and uh, sponsored by Canna. Uh, yeah, that's that's very cool. So what was the so the top THC, top CBD? What, yeah. what were like what were they? So I had this really rad medical strain called um, Candida. Okay. It was by the um, medical marijuana genetics, I believe. Um, it's been a while. Um, but I actually started growing um, CBD, I guess, like not really. The first time I grew it was just big seeds, but I got motivated to grow my own CBD at the time because my dog was diagnosed with epilepsy, a really severe mm. case of oh, epilepsy. That's sad. Yeah, he um, he was four at the time, and um, the the doctor said the epilepsy was so severe that he had to go on some heavy barbiturates, and that would just like decrease his life expectancy because it's so hard on the liver and oh. like other internal organs and whatnot. So he was cool with the CBD as like a sidekick because it helped relieve some of the symptoms from the harsh medications. Okay. And they had actually told me that he would only live to be, I'm um, about eight years old. And he passed away last year when he was 14. Oh, so wow. So he ate with CBD that oh. whole time. And I, I, I truly believe that that like helped lengthen his quality of life. That's incredible. Um, so very cool. That was the CBD that I had run i did a pheno hunt at home um and selected there's two different phenotypes with this candida one is an indica dominant one is a sativa dominant and the sativa dominant one is more of a unicorn to find it's higher in cbd and that was the one that i found very sassy hard to grow ridiculous but um at i think it was around 12 percent cbd in that wow. win but the thc was under 0.3 so it was considered a hemp variety okay okay so, very cool yeah very that's cool high for him. and as high as 19 i want to say or 20 some people Man. have got that one yeah yeah hemp hemp's tough right like people don't realize that they think oh it's hemp you just throw it in a field and you grow it and it, it's not the case i remember being at mcgill when they were doing studies so i wasn't teaching i was there for a conference of some sort and they had a big hemp program, scientific study on hemp. And the biggest challenge outside of growing it was harvesting it. So they were using traditional harvest techniques and, and combines to try and take this down. And the hemp is so fibrous, so strong. Yeah, it was yeah. destroying the equipment at I the bet. time. So this is, you know, five, six years ago. But um, kudos. That's awesome. I mean, there's a lot of different awards that are out there, but we're glad that uh, that you're picking them up because we've we've tracked your story for quite some time and we know that you're well deserving of them. So um, we'll get Thank into some you. of that. Now, you have been quoted as saying uh, cannabis has saved your life and then it gave you a life. Right. I want to yes. touch on that for a minute um, and go back into that that history, because your journey, you know, we have a lot of different individuals that come on the show. Um, some date back 35, 40 years of growing and, you know, struggling in that, um, your journey while long so far, it's not 35, 40 years. So maybe walk us through, what does that mean? Cannabis saved your life? Cause I know, but the audience needs to know this. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I, 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 um, am on this legacies podcast and I am friends with a lot of people that have these long histories and legacy cannabis, um, you know, like you said, 30 years, 40 years. Um, my dad used to grow weed in the closet and I wouldn't even say he would be part of a legacy grower, but I mean, as a home grower, yes. He was he legacy. Grew, he was this, legacy. He was figuring yeah, stuff out. Yeah. For sure. And like, um, so that's kind of where I got the idea or first ever saw a cannabis plant. Um, you could, could you smell my, it first? <laughs> oh, like I was good. So he was good. <laughs> I was in my 20s and I was like, oh, I was hungover and I was going to go out smoke a joint because at that time I was drinking and drugging and like that's what I used for hangovers was weed. And my parents are pretty strict and like so I like to shock them whenever I could. It was, you know, going <laughs> home. So I was like, my dad was having a conversation with me and I was like, I got to go outside and smoke this. And he was like, I'll join you. And I was like, okay. So he smoked a cigarette and I smoked my joint. And then he was like, I'm going to show you something. And he took me into his, him and my mom's bedroom and um, opened the closet. I didn't smell nothing. And there was weed plants growing in there. And I was like, what? <laughs> like this, like, my, like I grew up in a really strict household, like very lot of 
routine and structure and um so it was shocking like absolutely shocking i thought i was gonna be shocked and my dad like i'm gonna go smoke a joint dad yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's like i'm growing weed you know so he like yeah. piled in some weed into a little bag and gave me some brownies because that's how he, he consumed it and it actually helped my dad get off alcohol which is a whole different story but um it, you know it's just that's kind of the beginning part of it but right I didn't really reach out for it or anything until I was, um, it was, it was like 2015, 2016. I had been sober a few years from everything, drugs, alcohol, marijuana, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when I got sick, um, in 2015, I was diagnosed with colitis and, um, because of my history with drugs and alcohol, and being abstinent, I didn't really want to dwell into some of the prescriptions that they were offering me to relieve the pain. It was like a really severe case of um, ulcers, chronic ulcers. And I lost a considerable amount of weight. I was like on death's door, um, either like nutritionally it was going to take me out or I was going to take my own life because the pain was just too much. Yeah, yeah. And um, a lot of people were suggesting marijuana, but I had been going to 12 step meetings at the time and so mm. i had brought it up to those kinds of people my psychologist like my whole i had a whole entourage of people i was living in edmonton at the time and so a medic medical wrap around and everyone was like no like you can't do that basically yeah. well shun you and so i i just kept living in pain until one day my buddy was like just smoke this and i did and um for the first time I, um, you know, I had a little bit of an appetite and it was yeah. just like that small little step that, um, I still remember that feeling to this day. And that's why I say it saved my life. It saved my life physically. Um, I just got so desperate that I didn't care. Like, everyone right. told me you're just going to go right back into propane and booze. And like, as soon as you have that little hit, you know, and that's not what happened at all. So, um, I'm glad I took that risk. Cannabis slowly started letting me, um, heal inside my body um as it goes into every cell very good for the stomach and it just helped me nutri get my nutrition back um stabilize my weight and then i realized that it was also helping me emotionally and mentally and so um you know i was sober from drugs and alcohol for about four years at that time but i would say like i was white knuckling it a lot so I realized that the weed was helping take the edge off. Right. And it wasn't doing anything negative in my life at all in any way. So it was just my medicine at the time. Yeah. That's, that, uh, that I love that. I started was back only in 2016. So very early, um, I just started sort of delving into genetics, I guess. I mean, I remember going to my drug dealer's house. And we'd be sniffing through all the weeds and like <laughs> the sommelier guy. And he's the one that introduced me to strains um, because before he used to just buy weed, right? Right. That he Didn't he, we all? It was just, it was weed. Yeah, it, it was, was weed. weed. Do you have weed? It, it was, well, sorry. Yeah. Could, yeah, but yeah. They didn't have names or anything. Right. And he started getting us really like, I was paying three hundred dollars for an ounce, like that kind of shit, you know, three twenty wow, yeah. for an ounce. You can Jeez. work good, sticky, like. Nothing like you'd ever seen. It had a name like Black Dog or like Rockstar. And um, so we spent so much time researching genetics. We would get high. We would try all the weeds. I'd buy some. And then we would spend all day just like listening to music and talking about the genetics. And like, wouldn't it be cool to try this or grow this? And we would have all these talks for a year, two years. I don't know, before this even. Yeah. Um, and then when I decided I needed to start growing because weed became too expensive. Um, I kind of already had that prior research because of all those days <laughs> yeah. together researching, yeah. just like, you know, making a list of wouldn't it be nice, but we just never did it. Right. Um, so that's I just cool, though. started I there, I guess, with genetics. I knew where to go, what I wanted right away. Um, I started with um, BC Seeds and then went over to Amsterdam Marijuana Seeds because when BC Seeds was out of seeds, they sent you to AMS. Oh, okay. And so I was grateful, though, because those are some of the best genetics, even to this day, that I've worked with. And it was like White Widow, oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Girl Scout Cookies, uh, Liberty Haze from Barney's Farm. I'm still growing that to this day. I had some Barney's Farm way back, and I, I actually like some of their genetics. Yeah, I haven't tried a lot, but I've tried enough that they're pretty stable. 
Um, so you start, so most of this journey though was, you know, so you start with the research. I love that by the way. So, yeah, uh, you know, they, everyone is, oh, you know, cannabis is a gateway drug. Fuck off. It is not right now. Maybe in the social circle aspect of chances are there may be at a raver or some sort of party, someone's got something harder than cannabis. I see that. Um, but I love the fact that one, it turned your health around, right? Because it's so often overlooked. I mean, in the medical side of cannabis, we talk about it a lot. Um, but it is, it's a healer of a lot of things, right? Um, or at least allows you to cope. And unfortunately in your situation, you know, being in those circles of, you know, and I, I can understand why they would say, you don't touch it. You know, you've gone through rehab, you're clean, you're sober, you know, you would want to err a caution across the board. Yeah. That's all they need. Right. Right. That's but you know, thing. just, just having a stance of no is very difficult because even myself, I went through that as well, right? Chronic pain, everything under the sun so that we get to the point where they want to prescribe Lyrica and some of these other ones that are literally changing your brain chemistry to be able to deal with pain. And I'm like, no, fuck this. This is not what I'm doing anymore. Um, well, and then went right into cannabis. My cannabis use was always there, but I started to do that research and find out, well, what is going to work better? Will edibles work? Will oils work? Does CBD work? And um, so I love that for you. I think that's incredible. Um, the oh, yeah. length of the journey, yeah, the length of the journey isn't as important as how much you embrace it. And that's what it seems that you did. So you did most of this genetic and phenotype hunting and playing around in home grows first at just at home, correct? Yeah. And and so was it grow tents? Was it a room? Yeah. So I started in a two by two closet. So I was living with my partner at the time. That's not enough weed. <laughs> my health isn't you don't know how fast you're gonna like get addicted to it but i was like i just need a couple of plants and like trying to make it as like <laughs> uh, cheap as possible like yeah. my partner at the time was really nervous about me buying anything to do with like growing weed even you know this was just a couple of years prior to legalization but he was really quite against it from the beginning right and it did start off like at his defense like it started off as like i'm just gonna grow a couple of plants and I had like these seeds and so, um, but pretty much as soon as I, I decked out my closet with like mylar and like really, really <laughs> getting into it. Yeah, and, you're like, going to another level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mars hydro light to start with and like had my first crop and like did everything wrong and learned from all of that. Had lots of different mentors at the time and just really like soared through it. So like it wasn't long before I, I had ordered two tents so that I could do a perpetual grow, retired my closet for a dry space. I had a full <laughs> crop centering and cultivation facility just in my craft room. And I was trying to, like, and I was moving it through the house, like, <laughs> all of a sudden downstairs, came processing and drying. I you, to get you're doing kitchen. it all before it even happens. My That's awesome. My kitchen turned into, like, so... My partner had lots of valid reasons for sure, being sure. frustrated yeah. with me, <laughs> but um, it is it is also the reason I had to leave too. We just couldn't agree on it. Um, but I mean, that's how passionate I am about it. It was just like comes down to if you are going to make me choose between this, isn't just a hobby for me. Obviously, right. like at that point, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to make some decisions here, and I. I was doing social work at the time. I did that for 15 years in Edmonton. Um, it was my career. I had worked my way up in it. I was with a company, the last company, for 13 years. And so it was a hard decision, but easy at the same time. I was like, I quit. I retire. I'm never coming back. Um, I told my partner at the time, I'm moving out. Like, I'm going to go and work in weed. So I... Um, what was, what was, I mean, besides the, the, you know, the breakup and stuff, what was the reaction to, well, wait a second, you were just a social worker. Now you're going to work in cannabis. Are you nuts? Like what was yeah. that reaction? It wasn't just him, but most people thought I was going through, I guess, a midlife crisis at the time. I would have been like just coming up to 40 and like, but it wasn't, it was like, I was, I'm not, I'm a logical person. I, I make decisions on logic, not emotion. Like I, I am, I was pretty thorough, at, but fast with my decision making, you know? So mm -hmm. people were just like, oh, like, we'll see her back here probably or whatever. I just didn't right. listen to the buzz at all. I just nice. like broke free from that. Um, made sure my daughter was okay. My daughter's 25 now. She was 20, I guess, at the time, already out on her own, wanted to make sure she was cool with the distance I was going to be doing. So I was only going off to old. 
um, that area, which was about an hour and a half from Edmonton, two hours. And so back then it was crazy. I moved out. Um, I took my camper and I lived in that for four months. Worked my buns off at um, Sundial. Okay. Um, then moved over to Candry, found a nice little trailer, stayed kind of there, but went back and forth to Edmonton to visit my daughter every week. It was like a, a lot of shift work. It was a crazy time. But, yeah, um, it sounds like it. <laughs> that, that'd be a lot. Yeah, well, and, and that's the thing. If you can say, listen, this was fun. It was an experience. Um, yeah. And it sounds like you gained a ton of experience doing so as well. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like at Sundial? What were you doing at Sundial at the time? Um, so I went from, just to give a little chronological order, I did the the college, uh, old college cannabis production course in 2018, um, did the practicum for a couple weeks at Acreage Farms, Okay. then um, spent some time tying up my loose ends and went over to Sundial in June of 2019. And so I spent a year at uh sundial and it was it felt like five years in one year because so much happened in that year and i learned right. so much too so i watched like what it was like to work at a facility that started with 200 people and went up to a thousand people within a few months and then down to 600 people like i went through all of that covid hit during that year that was crazy to watch people just like freak out and leave and um it was just like a skeleton crew too during those months and we were still producing rooms and rooms of weed. Like that facility was 500,000 square feet. Wow. wow. And, uh, Is it, so Sundial was, was greenhouse or was Sundial's greenhouse or in um, no, complete indoor? indoor. And, yeah. So all okay. pods, it was a collection of pods. We had to, from one area, I mostly worked in veg with mothers um, or irrigation. I did irrigation at Sundial. Um, so you're kind of, in this veg space that was their original initial building. And then they just started adding pods to to the building. And between where the original building started to the fifth sort of pod way or whatever, it was at least a kilometer in distance. Like, Whoa, so that wow. you have an idea of how far yeah, yeah. you had to go day to day to get through. And within each huge wing, there'd be 20 to 22 flower rooms or flower it's, it's a big you know, cultivation. Four thousand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of cultivation team for sure. So COVID hit, and that must have just oh it was man, wild, that would have been tough. People group like flies. They were going through layoffs anyways, but most of the rooms were still running. So it was. It took a lot of manpower to to get that stuff out. I bet. I bet. And then you went over to so from Sundial, you went to Condre. Is that is that how Candry, you say it? Yeah, Candry. Yeah. Okay. We're in, um, sundry alberta beautiful area i love that area yeah and so it was during that time that you were noticed and recruited was it not yeah so i applied at sundry for the irrigation lead and um back then i guess that would have been like 2020 um so two years into sort of people working in these facilities and stuff and at the beginning they were really strict about no cameras like and things like that right um, but at Candry, it was the first opportunity where I was already, I was, it didn't matter. I was filming at Sundial, whether they liked it or not. I just wasn't posting. So I have tons of content and footage sure. from all this, from my portfolio. <laughs> Why um, not? <laughs> it's <yeah>. your work. <laughs> and so Candry, I was doing the same thing, but they were a lot more open to letting me, um, post stuff or make marketing material for them. Yep. And then because I was in the rooms and they were seeing that it, you know, the this the partners and the brand partners were really liking my content. And so um it sort of blossomed at Candry, I wanna say. Yeah. That I was like, Oh, look what I can do. I can make all this uh show everyone behind the scenes, like come see where medicine's being made and come and see how all this equipment works. And at Candry it was a Cadillac facility, everything's automated and like vertical three tier you know uh what are those called when you go through the air thing <laughs> oh yeah the uh i know what you mean um i can't remember what they're called they were yeah a lot of a lot of facilities implemented that early on and then it started to die off there you go there you go yeah oh i loved going through that thing every day like <laughs> yeah. on the way a little in, extra time uh, in there <laughs> yeah. i probably have a reel you know, from yeah. one of those very things. space Probably age right money machine yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I missed the air shower, obviously. Yeah, very cool. Um, but yeah, so I just I just started doing some cool stuff, and then 
that's when Stuart Farms found me. Katrina saw me online. I had actually made a reel because I love their bath bombs so much. I made my own bath bombs. I, I'm, I infuse all my own oils. I actually started doing all the infusion stuff and research on that and all diving into that a couple of years before I started growing. Okay. I, I love that I, I, I read somewhere that it was, I think Tanner had said, by the way, I didn't get a chance to meet up with Tanner at Can Expo. I However, missed him completely somehow. <laughs> We're going to get into the grape. I need to understand that too. Um, but I love that. I think there was a quote in one of the articles I read. It was Tanner had said, we need someone like her. And it's Katrina, correct? K Katrina yeah. Jackson. And she said, no, we need her. So yeah. at that point in time must be when they start that recruitment, what was the outreach like? What was the pitch and proposal to say, hey, we need you in the Maritimes. We need you to come all the way to New Brunswick. And how sweet was the fucking deal for you to go, I'm going to the Maritimes. I'm going to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so help us understand that because, I mean, that is, reading that, I was like, that that there's so much respect in that to say we need someone like her. Um, and I've seen Tanner and we've met, I think, you know, historically a couple of times, but um, for Katrina to say, no, we need her. That's who we need. Um, what was that like for you? Um, it just felt really, really good, I think, because it was my first instance of feeling, I guess, valued by um, legal cannabis because I had been at these other places and yes, worked my way up, but hard, it was hard to work my way up, get noticed. Um, and not just because I'm a woman. I was going to ask is partially because you're a woman. Yeah. Yeah. You know, my coworkers who were always men typically in cultivation could do this and this and this or suggest this and this and this. And then the lead would just be like, yeah. I would have to prove it first. So I would have to do things, see, oh, I did this. Look at this. This was the result. Like, So I did a lot of that, knowing and being confident in my own skills that I wouldn't fuck things up. And so that's sort of how I had to do everything. It's just a little bit harder. Right. <laughs> a little bit harder. Um, so to get that validation just felt incredible um, that a CEO was looking at me and being like, these things that people don't like about you, we want those things. Yeah, yeah. Want things. Yeah. And that was like, wow, okay. So it was really just one Zoom call during the thick of COVID in 2021. It was like April. I was looking for a new change, a new challenge um, after Kandri and, uh, or still at Kandri. And I was getting sick of salt and factory type um automation uh what i would consider more corporate cannabis um large scale facility type work repetitive shit no creativity no genetics like any chance at all these facilities where i could be in the genetics in some way i was and right. so um his big offer was that he showed me his seed library you knew your candy <laughs> yeah he, he did yeah. He told me that I would spend the first year pheno hunting. I got to select everything. When I saw his seed library, it was like a me. And <laughs> all, almost all his genetics come from California. He, we have real cuts here that are from Kevin Jodry. Um, I'm not going to tell you how they got to Canada, but they are. I have an idea. <laughs> so it was just like all of that combined. Like Kevin Jodry was uh, the next person I was to talk to. And I was so nervous about that because he was a big um, part of the board at, at that time. And he was going to be making the decision on who was going to be the next um, director of cultivation. His tenor had gone through like five guys. And um, these guys just weren't working out because they just didn't want to be with the plants. Whereas I oh. didn't want to be with the paperwork. I want to be with the plants. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it worked out well in that way. And so I was wanting to get out of Alberta at the time. I am kind of a gypsy at heart and have lived around my whole life. And so it wasn't really such a big deal for me to just pick up and go across Canada. Right, right. That's it cool. was, and but it wasn't. I'm a single lady. I had my daughter's grown. Like it was just, it was an easy decision because I love the East Coast. Never been to New Brunswick. But from what I saw, it looked great. <laughs> <clears throat> We've seen videos. And so where, um, remind me again, where is Stewart Farms in New Brunswick again? We are in St. Stephen, New Brunswick. So the very southern part of New Brunswick, it's kind of its own microclimate here. It's different than any other part of the province. It's a lot like tropical Florida weather. And Tanner did tell me that before I came out here. And I was like, okay, cool. And he's, it's true. It's humid. Really? It's hot in summer. Wow. 
it, it looks beautiful. I mean, the videos we've seen, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. So, and the population isn't very large. No. So I was in Sundry at the time, which was 2000 population to 4000. So I bumped up. I'm like, there's a <laughs> okay, Burger so you, King yeah, here. Well, yeah, <laughs> Burger King. Yeah, we're good. Does it have a Taco Bell? That's the question. No, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, then, not then we're not there thing. just yet. Yeah. It I'd seems like that's the marker. And the Wendy's, but yeah. you know, I'm, the city's about an hour and a half and I, I make do. Yeah, I get that's to not so bad. Use them once a month. <laughs> good enough, then, right? Yeah. So you, so you make that trip. You take the camper cross country, or you just <laughs> back it all in and get on the flight. I basically just got rid of everything. I usually do that every few years, anyways. And so, how do you I had do that? I don't. know. <laughs> I want I to do that. I can't do that. Genevieve, Genevieve is like me. I'm not sentimental to any of that stuff. Yeah, either. that's awesome. You know, I'm about to move this week. Yeah, it's a perception thing, I think. It's like you have to get in the zone and just be like, gone, gone. Like, who's this picture of this kid? I don't know. Gone. Like, <laughs> hey, gone. Oh, wait, that was a baby picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could be, right? I don't know. But I've That's moved awesome. a lot, so I've just done that at all those opportunities. So I didn't have a lot of stuff. I um, was borrowing furniture at the time in this trailer anyways, and so I just got rid of stuff that I couldn't fit, which was basically all of my plants. And mm. like, so I had to, that was the hardest thing was like I had, 50 house plants that I've had forever. Um, I was able to keep a few things, but it was that tight. I had a large dog I was bringing with me, a cat in my Jeep with just a small U-Haul. So it took us nine days. My daughter came with me for a fun trip. We made it nine days and we had to go the whole country <laughs> through COVID. Um, so it's like desolate out there. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear it. When we got to New Brunswick, so I'd never been to New Brunswick, me and my daughter just coming through Quebec. It was like, we didn't really smoke weed kind of like in the vehicle when we we're in Quebec because it's kind of, you just never know where. It's, so that's like a different country. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, like going into a different is. country. It's like, everything's different. I don't know if I should be here. Yeah, I was nervous. So anyways, we got into New Brunswick and then we decided, oh, we got to the New Brunswick um sign or whatever and yeah. we were gonna let's you know we got out we stretched our legs it was four in the morning or two in the morning i can't remember now we smoked a joint and then we got back in and went you know we have an hour left or two hours left and we went around the corner of where the sign was and there's like a whole patrol up and like i was like holy shit what <laughs> like patrol up and uh yeah, the guy was like, we had it was the only province where they wanted us to physically check in because of all the COVID shit. That oh, was right. Time. Yeah, and yeah. It was uh, July 2021. And so I had to have my letter from my employer. And like, so yeah, I had to find everything. Oh, my God. Just and, and just shortly after blasting a J too, right? Yeah, it was really inconvenient. <laughs> oh but the guy was really cool. <laughs> That's nice. That's nice. Yeah, I'm just going to grow weed in your province. Um, You have a problem with that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, what are you doing here? You know, um, yeah. well, yeah, I've been uh, elected to come yeah. and make uh, the East Coast sweet really, really great. Yeah, yeah. Have you heard of bath bombs? We're going to do some bath bombs. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's very cool. So, you, you know, upon arrival, you get there, you get unpacked, obviously get settled in. Um, from what we've seen and what we know about Stewart Farms, it seems very, I mean, we just watched the video this morning. I didn't know this one existed, but the full house play. Um, <laughs> It's, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. I love it. Um, it's one of my favorites. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's super fun, but it seems like a truly family oriented facility. And people say that a lot. Oh, it's very family like. Uh, depending on the family, you may not want it to be family like or family oriented, but it seems like it is with Stewart Farms. It is. Yeah. We have a really gr great group of people here. And like, people that have just been here the whole time so that like speaks for itself too i think in such a transient industry um most of our team members have been here since the beginning including the production people in the back they're just we just have a good culture here we just make sure like katrina and i like that is our number one priority and we filter that down so yeah um toxicity isn't allowed you know like people are allowed to have bad days of course but of course, no bad yeah. seeds we fight like we hire quick but fire quick too so it's like i've never That's seen your that facilities right like you, yeah it's just what you have to do if someone comes on and they're not a good fit because of things you just you gotta have the conversation yeah it's i don't understand that why 
you know, cor- regardless of the business or corporation, they'll keep people on longer than they yeah, should be. Yeah, they're moving around. That's usually yeah, what uh, I'm they're not the, doing good there. We're going to put them somewhere else. Quite a yeah. bit. Whoa, <laughs> this this Brad guy, we're living over here, and then, <laughs> oh, he's a bad guy over here too. So we're going to move over here. That might fix it. No, nope. oh, we still just room <laughs> people over here. Let's move them over here. Right. Yeah. It's funny that we do that. Um, I, I've I've been part of that, you know, many years ago in the yeah. corporate life, and. We always used to joke and we say those that are unfit, we just move them further up in the management chain. We just keep, keep moving them to the top that we can strip responsibility away and they're just not really affecting anything anymore. Um, so so I want to talk about product development, uh, at least touch on it, because Stuart Farm sees very much in that space of product development. And yeah. I think when we had met before, you'd mentioned that's a lot to do with Katrina. Um, you know, I think you had been encouraging her. She's got to get out there more about it. Maybe do some appearances like this or whatever it might be, but bath bombs, you know, topicals, like there's a lot of really cool shit that Stuart Farms does. Yeah. Uh, I believe Katrina's got over 20 different SKUs, um, in topicals, which is unreal. And that's a lot of years. Like she is pumping out the ideas. Um, her brain Can is you keep solid. up? That's the question. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, boom, boom, next, next, next. So um, I'm really proud of her. She's really proud of herself. Um, Zero Farms is successful because of that brain is what I what I would say is because of all these really cool, innovative, um, topical 2.0 products. Uh, that's what launched us off the ground because like the weed didn't really pick up until um, I want to say like you know, two years ago, at least like, so I had to come up board and then we basically got started at that point. So that took about six months to a year to really build, build up that, that side of things. So we, when I got here, Topicals was already like a full force engine. Um, and so anyone that is starting like a, a weed company, they have to have, it's, you can't just sell weed. Unfortunately, right. you have, to have yeah. other ideas and other ways to um to make sales work and that's two point x yeah for sure i think there's there's some companies that do weed really well and they just stick to it and so i I still don't understand in some cases how some do just a few skews and they get away with it um typically you see that on the micro side or the craft side yeah more often sure um but what wes and i were talking you know pre-show about the bath bombs and wes originally thought that stewart uh farms bath bath bombs were cbd and i'm like no 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 there's they're heavy in THC. Yeah. What is the science behind that? Like, we have some what, of the most potent topicals on the market, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like super potent. Um, yeah. The, so, what is the highest concentrate THC in a bath bomb right now? Is it 300 or 250? It's 200. 100 milligrams of THC and 100 milligrams of CBD is our, is our most potent bath bomb. But our bath salt. Um, that's a different skew. And so we have bags that have a thousand milligrams of cannabinoids. So 500 THC, 500 CBD or a thousand CBD is what we offer. And Um, and what's the, uh, what's the effect like? Sorry, I don't mean to cut you off on that, but I'm really curious on, so obviously it's absorbed trans, transdermally, just like, you know, a topical, um, but how much? Like, and I, obviously the science, you can't say, well, you know, for every milligram that we have, but um, do you feel it in such a way that you're sedated? What is the effect of that? Yeah. So um, for me as a THC user, like I'm a daily user. So the way I feel the effect is um, I'll put a couple bath bombs in that bathtub or the entire 1000 milligrams um, for that effect. And then usually I'll smoke a joint either in the tub or before the tub. Folks that are listening, this is Genevieve's <laughs> prescription. <laughs> Not everyone's. No, yeah. just for me. <laughs> and, uh, and then everything is amplified for me. So the high, I'm way higher, like almost to the point where I've been nauseous. So you green out if you, if you're, if you're too high in the tub. Yeah. yeah. For a person that doesn't consume anything, and gets in the tub from what I've heard. And you can go on our website and see our reviews. But it's like they feel like their body is high. Their body feels so good in yeah. the silk. And you should stay in it for at least half an hour to 45 minutes. I stay in there for two hours. I just keep wow. reheating it up. Yeah, okay. I was going to say yeah. that gets cold after bombs. time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, that ends the show. I'm going to go get some Stuart bath bombs and we'll see you later. <laughs> 
(laughs) Seriously, though, like I said to Wes, I'm like, I've got to go source some of these. I'm in a smaller town, smaller population, but I'll drive when need be. Um, definitely want to try that. Yeah, you guys so, are going to send me your address and we'll send you a care pack and then you can split them between each other. Try them out. We need more men in the tub. Done. More witch in the tub? Amazing. More men, men in the in tub. The tub. <laughs> and, and Wes had said that. He's like, you know, I haven't had a bath and, and I'm like waiting yeah, for it. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, shower. Yep. He's had a shower at least. Um, but I think that it's, it's very interesting. The salts is super appealing as well. Yeah. I have used um, lotions or uh, ointments, creams before that are, you know, I think they're 250, 300 milligrams, something like that, uh, yeah. with successful use of such. We have one of the most successful uh, medical balms, so B-A-L-M, topical. It's in a little, I'll send you guys one. One's um, turmeric and one is lavender. So um, they're 500 milligrams in each tiny little balm. And so they're okay. supposed to last you about a month. And those things that the most reviews on our website are from the like people with Bell's palsy, nerve disorders, like it's taking away um, nerve damage. Uh, it's like helping with arthritis. I use it. I have um, pretty bad arthritis from irrigation. And oh, so yeah. I come home and just like put it all over my hands and they're way better than they've ever been. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's something that's just... It doesn't help everyone and everything. But... Of course, nor do medications or, or, you know, anything else. So I think it makes sense. And that's the thing, like as we're looking for other alternatives, individuals, especially entering the market, they always think, oh, I'm not going to smoke a joint. I'm not. Right. But and we think, well, it's, the market has come so far, but we're in it. Right. And it, so it's much different for us where you still have new entrants to the space that yeah. want to try something and they may have that. They may have back pain, wrist pain, arthritis. It could be a number of different, you know, items and that are affecting Katrina, them. Katrina and I went on a sales trip. We've been on a couple of sales trips. We went through Nova Scotia when our products were all over Nova Scotia. And the amount of bud tenders that broke down, hugging her, crying, just because of what her products have helped them with was like, wow. oh, like I'm going to go smoke a joy while Katrina chats with these guys for like 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah. That was every single store. That's so, so awesome. It's, just, it's incredible to see and watch. Yeah, yeah that's awesome. Um, tell us about, I know that you had mentioned the tanner. When you see them, you got to get them some daily grape. What infatuates you with grape, one, but the daily grape and the success of that? Because Stuart Farms is doing that very well. Yeah, so one of my first projects, well, my first project coming to Stuart Farms, first week was to go through the genetic, um, seed bank and pick out based on some things that Tanner wanted fruits and things um, for the next genetic pheno hunt. So I went through quite a few different um, genetics with my team and I've always wanted to find a real grape. And so grape was going to be for sure on my list. And he had a bunch of different breeders with different grapes. And so the one that I chose was the daily grape based on sort of that would have been 2021 and sort of at the time the Sunday driver was really popular in the states and most of my mentors come from southern states and so it's like where I'm kind of getting my trends from (laughs) and um and so I had just heard a lot of great things about it and that's one of the the, that is in the lineage and so that was my main reason for choosing the daily grape and so I dropped uh 300 seeds of 15 different strains and there were 22 different daily grapes. Out of those um, 300 seeds, over the year of pheno hunting, we narrowed everything down to um, 120. And, and the daily grape had five solid flowering females. Um, all of them were so beautiful, like dark purple with deep. Like if you've seen the Do you have pictures of them still loads of crystals on it just like yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like, and this daily grape number six which is my sweet queen she just smelled the best the whole time i just like every time i passed that one i was like oh it's like smells like grape bubblegum like and you just <laughs> you think that's not going to transfer usually it doesn't because grape not is normally yeah you just don't find it a real solid grape and um so yeah just after 
probably two harvests of it and narrowing it down and narrowing it down based on COAs. And now we're bringing THC into it. I always like to start the hunt without the COA involved. So the first round of cuts isn't even based on COAs. So I guess I could be an idiot and losing shit, but <laughs> I just feel like I'm so connected with the plants. I just yeah. know. Yeah. And so, and I'm a medical patient, but that's first and foremost. So I've never really been motivated by THC. Yeah. Um, anyways, so the daily grape, was very much picked based on the smell and the aroma and the experience. Um, she also is very easy to grow. So for growing at scale, it's an easy plant. It doesn't have a lot of foliage, so it's easy for harvest and post-harvest. Um, it's frosty AF, like density beyond trichome on trichome on trichome. Like every time you touch that plant, like I can put my phone under the... Uh, canopy and like just from defoliating it's covered in frost and wow. it's like and it's still testing between 28 percent and 33 percent so it's which is losing, high that's still yeah, high it's like really high trichomes, but they're yeah. still intact enough that it's getting that high percentage that's so cool um there's only been i think one or two grapes air quote grapes that i've come across that i was like yeah, yeah i i see it train i see it still there but I mean, grape as a terpene is not the most prominent. So there's other things that are bred into it that have made it come to that, right? Which is, yeah, is very cool. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So grape is, grape, strawberry, watermelon, pineapple, those kind of smells are created from esters in the plant and different kind of, um, I think, alcohols and fla flavonoids mm -hmm. uh, and not necessarily terpenes. Terpenes are all because it's an entire chemical composition, right? So you're looking at the smell as a whole. So it just shows you how unique that grape or strawberry or pineapple smell really is because it's like, yeah, you can get lemons all day. You just need to dial in your limonene, right? Uh, grape and other more um, tropical aromas, uh, it, it's just harder to actually find real ones. People claim to have them. It's just you got to experience it and find out. Right, right. So what's but what's I've number grown two? Down then? All sorts of different environments because we have contract growers and they all smell the same. So it's <laughs> a very consistent. Yeah, a consistent that's cool. That's cool. Genetic, well, yeah. So so daily grape being one of the front runners for Stewart Farms and yourself. What was what's number two? Number two is okay. So daily grape and then banana pudding tain. So she. Won't be available. Um, I want it already. I mean, just by the name, but. <laughs> yeah. So if you think of bananas and skunk, so it's very old school skunk with some ripe bananas on the top of it, which is like another hard smell to. And when's that available? Real. Um, I'm still dialing in the genetic because I never want to release anything, but I want to release it this year. So I'm getting it really prepared to start doing that. Export, we'll see it first. So Australia gets the first taste of banana, and then we'll Man. see how it does. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always the way it goes. I'm always the bridesmaid. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we pulled out a wreck here in Canada because um, we didn't have enough grape to supply the, oh, okay. the demand. And so, which is a good problem as a grower. Uh, but it sucks that I don't have the space because then I could be doing more, right? Right, right, right. Uh, that makes sense. Tell us about buy weed from women. I love these shirts. I want one. Where do I get one? Number one, but also tell us the story. So buy weed from women. Um, it's, I guess a movement, um, starting in the States and it's, um, you know, people of color, women, just any sort of diverse group sort of like just showcasing or, you know, um, awareness about our disadvantages and other people's privilege maybe so the sorry regular white male that dominates the industry right yes absolutely it needs to be talked about and i think that it's missing right now is it you know we kind of just glaze over it and there's there's a lot of speak around it that it's you can sell that it's self-serving it's not genuine and that that shit pisses me off the most that's why we you know at high flyer legacies we don't pump it a lot because we don't want to come off as not being genuine about it but at the yeah. root of it it is you know because you talked about when um what was the category um w women grower best best in class women grower what was the one that you yeah. won top, like for me female grower so they had a top grower and then top female <laughs> right so and and which i guess from your perspective i'd like to understand does that category make sense because for me 
best is best, right? Whether yeah. male or female. I don't I don't label that. It is best grower, but from a female perspective, does that make yeah. sense to have that for you? Um, for me, it was like almost like it was um, I look at the advantage I look at that is that it was a stepping stone for me to reach before I could get to top grower. And maybe that's just me justifying it. But um, that no longer exists anymore. So the way I look at it now is that they saw that maybe had a bad look. People did complain about it. They were moved. So they okay. do better. Right. Right. Uh, right. But yeah, as a female looking at that, it's a separation, right? You're saying that I can't be Canada's top grower, but I right. can be. Yeah, you can be yeah, the top growers. female grower. Well, yeah. How many female growers are there in Canada? How many female master growers? Maybe 5% of us, right? Or let's be generous and say 10% are female. Right, which I don't think there are. No, there. I know three of us. So <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, and you, you know? talked about your struggles at some of the other facilities where, you know, men could just say it. This this yeah. pisses me off so much. Men could say it all of a sudden, smartest person in the room. And meanwhile, you've got the most intelligent that is not being recognized and they have to prove themselves. Too, yeah. yeah, that I, I, <laughs> my wife knows this because we talk about this stuff a lot. And it's why still is this happening, right? So I've got a source of buy weed for women shirt. I will support that yeah, 100%. Yeah, so you just go onto their website. You can, I can send it to you through the DMs, but like follow them on Instagram. There was a bit of controversy. I'm not exactly sure. And if you want the full history, I didn't speak to it properly. So oh, they will look it up yeah. on their website. Mm -hmm. But I, I do, I need to go back in and get a uh, new shirt. They got a jacket. They have this nice orange long sleeve I want to wear. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Very so you cool. Can purchase it on, through on, their through their website. On, on all that, Genevieve, I think you know you're I think you're a massive inspiration, especially you know everything you've achieved and stuff like that. Like, I'd like to know if you know is there a message you'd like to send to to women out there who are considering getting into the industry, and what would you like to say to them? Is you know is there anything you'd like them to learn or something to know prior to getting in or mm -hmm. anything like that? I think. Um. I think I can speak to not just women, but like women of a certain age, right? Like, so the women in my generation, I'm 45, turning 46 in a couple of weeks. And um, so for me to be 40 years old and decide to change my life and career path and like just do all that stuff is like what 20 year olds do. So it was like, it was pretty difficult, right? And um, whether you're, I guess, female or male, but um, I would just tell those women out there to just start the work, start the research, uh, start learning, take a course. Now there are so many different courses you can take online, you know, reach out. There's an overwhelming amount of information now, whereas even in 2016, people weren't sharing their information. Um, so I would just say, like, just get up and be a part of it. It's so new right now that anyone can enter it, you know, like there's so much going on and things that are changing constantly to uh, the industry, to the regulations, to the consumers. Um, it's just, it's a fast paced moving industry and there's room for everybody. So I, I love, love that. that room for everybody. That's important, right? And even, you know, when we started the podcast, they're like, people are like, oh, great. Another fucking podcast. And we're like, there's room. There's, <laughs> there's plenty of room for everybody, right? Our format's a little bit different. Our guests are different and unique. Um, and that's what we wanted to do is just be able to tell that story behind the legacy. And despite length, we don't think that there's a, a necessary length to be put on a legacy, right? You've built one, but you're also building one. So, um, what's the, what's the future for, for Stewart farms? What's, what's, what's next on the table? Um, so this year we're really focusing in on export. Um, and so we're just, trying to pump up our partnerships and our cultivation space. Um, so right now I'm looking for investment money. <laughs> I get <laughs> three million to um, phase up here right at the farm so then I can be in full control of my facility, which is the part I like the most, the weed that I grow here. Um, but then I also am looking for partners um, in this weed industry. Uh, we could be your sales partner at Stewart Farms. We are a very great sales team. And um, we do things nicely. Like, I don't know how else to say that, but there's a lot of people doing things not nicely out there. And so um, we have fair prices. Um, we have really high quality expectations. But I mean, 
if you want to be on a crew that's recognized for that top quality bed, we're like one of we're number uh, one of five on Avametics right now as a medical platform in Canada. We're in the top three in Australia for medical right now. Like it's like a, a pretty supreme team. So we're looking for micro cultivators, craft growers, people who grow in living soil or um, organics, aquaponics, anything like that, who would like to grow my daily grape. And we will buy it all off of you. That's it, Wes. I'm coming out of retirement, baby. I'm moving to New Brunswick. X4 and medical that everybody wants the grape. And so we just want more of it. That's so that's kind of going to be the next year, just pumping up that grape and then slowly bringing in the next one. I hope next year is going to be my pheno hunting year. I hope that three mil comes through this year so we can scale up and then my, this whole facility will turn into R&D. We'll manifest it together. You only want three million? Because we can go for five. Let's do five. five. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> we'll make it even better. You can come out and work with me. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. That makes sense. <laughs> awesome. Genevieve, anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? It's been an awesome pleasure having you on the show. I can tell you that much. Yeah, no, I, I, this one went really smoothly. Like, um, I can't think of anything. I just want to shout out my growers and my team and my partners in crime, Katrina, Tanner, um, all the ladies that I work with, all the female growers out there, women power, five women from weed. Yeah, I love it. I love it. All right, well, we're going to do some research. We'll make sure that we... You guys should come for a tour. We definitely want to. We're, we're actually thinking about getting Ross. Uh, Ross got us on this over at Ross's Gold, but he got us. He's talking about doing um, what is it, Wes? A motorhome or something? Wrapping yeah, a motorhome, like a, mo a, a motorcade. A big. We have a big tour to do. We, apparently, we've got to hit every problem. Yeah, we, we need. So you need sponsors. So that extra two million that we're going to raise together, we're going to use the two million to wrap a motorhome with legacies, and we'll do a coast to coast tour. Yeah, uh, maybe we can get you away from the grow a while. <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be for awesome? Sure. I have my teams so <laughs> trained and so they are amazing. I can leave for periods of time, no problem. Uh, so we'll we'll put a little lab in it, even just like MSC did way back in the day. Wes, you remember that uh, molecular science corp? <laughs> yeah, <there you> <laughs> we get a mobile lab. Okay, Genevieve, thanks so much for I'm joining in. Legacies. You yeah. are absolute rock star. Um, definitely need to be honored in this industry. Continue paving the way because that's what you're doing, and we love it. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for thinking of me. Um, this is exciting. And cheers to our future. <laughs> of course. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Hey, friends. Guess what? It's almost t-shirt season. Are you ready? You should be rocking your favorite brand. Head on over to thehighflyer.ca and check out all the licensed cannabis brand swag that we've got available. From Odo to Victoria Cannabis Company, Smoker Farms, Royal Harvest. The list goes on and on. And there's more coming on every single week. Check it out, add it to your cart, and be prepped. Sun's out, guns out. <laughs> and that was refreshing, eh, Wes? Definitely refreshing. Super inspiring. Um, I, I, she was going through her uh, accolades there, all her trophies. She must have a trophy room at this point. It's insane. I'd love to she, see it. She should have one. She doesn't seem real big on wanting to talk about them, but I think underlying, though, you can tell that it they mean a lot, and they should mean a lot because- absolutely. It, regardless, I you know, give me a give me a participation ribbon. Eh, give me a third place even. I'm happy. Um, but she's she's killing it. And good on Tanner and Katrina for seeing that and recognizing the opportunity with her um and recruiting her because that was probably one of the smartest business decisions they've probably don't get me wrong, Stuart Farms does a lot of good business, all right? And they're doing export, they're very um prominent in the medical side. But that was a very uh, smart decision that they made there. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. For sure. Well, um, it's been a great episode. Uh, I, I knew that this was going to be a good one speaking with her. And we're going to get to unpack and understand bath bombs. I got to go find some now. I got to get a bathtub because I don't even have a bathtub. But you <laughs> know, I'll figure we'll, that out. We'll, just, we'll get you in Lake Ontario. How many bath bombs do we need for Lake Ontario? Let's do the math on that. We'll see how many we can get in source. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Everybody so, gets high. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. So we'll look forward to next week. Next week we've got, uh, next Friday on. We've which, uh, got them on record as being available, being on the show, even if it's just Gavin, because you know, they tag team a lot of different stuff. Right. But, um, it'd be nice to have both of them on. We'll take who we can get. Absolutely. So, but uh, other than that, I guess we'll see everyone next week. That's right. Thanks for joining everyone. We'll see you next week on legacies.